Hi, welcome to my channel. My name is Lisa Allistway and I create inspirational and informational videos you can use and apply to your life. Today's guest is Scott Rouse, who is a behavior analyst and body language expert. He holds multiple certifications in advanced interrogation training and has been training alongside the FBI, Secret Service, US military intelligence, and the Department of Defense. His extensive training, education, and practice of nonverbal communication has made him an expert and consultant to law enforcement, as well as successful CEOs, attorneys, executives, and entertainers. Finally, you may have recognized Scott from his very popular YouTube channel, The Behavior Panel. I will be linking his website and channel in the description box below. Welcome, Scott. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sorry it took me so long to get here. I, this has been so much going on. It's unbelievable. I so believe I apologize. You. I've been watching the uh, the behavior panel channel just blow up. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's going good too. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So let's um, before we get into that, um, can you tell me a little bit why you chose to study uh, human behavior and body language? Well, I got into it when I was a little kid. I was about. I guess I was six. How, how old are you in the first grade? Seven? Uh -huh. Yeah, six, six or seven. Oh, really? yeah. yeah, six, seven years old. So we lived in a little town called Louisa, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And my dad was the only doctor in that whole town for a while. And it was like, you know, 2,000 people or something. And we lived right next door to the school. And the hospital, which is like this really big house, was just a few blocks down. So my mom would come and get my sister and I and bring my little brother with her because he wasn't in school yet. And we'd walk down to the hospital and eat lunch with my dad. And as we're eating lunch in there one day, I said, hey, however you say it as a kid, uh, I saw two buddies of mine. And what we were in, we were actually eating in his office, but it was like this huge, uh, there's another room they'd added on to it, but you could see out into the to the lobby, into the you know, little lobby part of his, of his office. And I saw two buddies of mine from my class, Billy Mead and um, Robert Bellamy. No, Billy Elkins. I always say Billy Mead for some reason, but it was Billy Elkins. And um, I said, well, look, I know those guys. <clears throat> I said, what's wrong with them? And my dad went like this. He went, oh, let's see. And he said, well, um, Robert has an earache. He's been up all night with his mom. And Billy is pretending he's sick. And I said, well, how do you know that? As a, however you say it as a kid. He said, well, let's take a look at him. And I said, okay, well, let's do that. So he said, now, let's look at Robert. And so we looked at Robert. And he said, now, what do you see about his mother? And I said, I don't know. It's his mom. He said, well, look, her hair isn't, isn't done. Every time we usually see her, her hair is done. She looks real pretty. She's got, usually has makeup and lipstick and things on and, and she's wearing, and I said, yeah. He said, see how her clothes look just a little bit wrinkly. And I said, yeah. So that tells me she's been up all night. Now let's look at Robert. And so we looked it over at Robert and of course he had his hand on his ear and he's leaning on his mom. So he said, see how his hands on his ear and he's leaning on his mom. And I said, yeah. He said, well, that tells me what hurts him is his ear. I was like, oh, this guy's brilliant. You know, oh my gosh, I can't believe he can tell that. And then I said, well, what about Billy? How can, you know, he said, well, let's take a look at him. He said, look at his mother. He said, she looks pretty. Her hair's done. She's got on makeup. She looks fresh. She's sitting up straight. And I said, yeah. He said, that tells me she got a good night's sleep. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, now let's look at Billy. And Billy had a magazine. And he was sitting there, had a magazine. He was dangling his legs off the little bench. He said, see how he's dangling his legs and, and his eyebrows are up while he's looking at that, it was like highlights or something. And I said, yeah. He said, well, in just a second, in a couple of minutes, what his mom's going to do, she's going to lean over, lean over and say something to him. And when she does, his eyebrows are going to go down. He's going to frown and he's going to look up at her from the side and he's going to talk to her for a second. She'll talk to him and she'll pat him on the, on the arm and then he'll go back to normal. He'll go back the way he was. And after about a minute, his eyebrows will go back up and his legs will start kicking again. And that tells me he's not sick. He's just pretending to be sick. Oh. I said, oh, well, son of a gun. That's exactly what was going on. And I just thought my dad was, was magic. I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And from that, it really affected me. So from that day forward, my everything focused on that. Everything focused on what not only what, some, what somebody was going through, but what they were going to do next. So that's sort of put me in the, the law enforcement military category. What does somebody, as you're talking to someone, what are they going to do next? Are they going to run? Are they going to hit you? Do they have a gun on them? Those types of things. Mm -hmm. And so as I grew up, I read every book that came out, every book I could get. When I was little, my dad would read things to me. You know, he would read me things that he found or saw in the paper or saw a study, and he would read me these things. 
So I was began being educated in it when, at a really, really, I guess a, almost a too young of an age. I don't know if it's too young, but really young. So and I just kind of, no matter what I was doing in my life, that always was number one and everything else sort of catch back to number two. So that's, and I just always been in it. Wow. So the so, seed was planted very, very young. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So um, I mentioned in the intro about the behavior panel, which is a great yeah. YouTube um, that kind of breaks down. It's very entertaining as well as educational about how to look at body language. And I know that I've been watching it and I've learned a lot about micro expressions and involuntary movements in the face and um, differences between what your body says and what your face says and how to analyze psychopaths and all kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us how did the behavior panel come together? How did it start? Whose idea was it? I know it's four guys. You guys have great chemistry, but can you tell me a little bit about the genesis of the behavior panel? Yeah, it was, well, Greg and I are buddies. We've been friends for a long time. And, uh, and he's, and I don't know, you, you should talk to Greg. Greg's, he's like the alpha of this thing because he's, he's the one that was in the army and was, and ran what's called SEER school, which is where you send, um, you, you know, uh, SEALs and CIA, everybody goes there. So if they get captured and they're interrogated, they won't talk. So that's, and that's to make a long story short, that's what that school is about. And Greg ran that for a while. So he's, he and I are, are always taught. We talk every day. So we were, we were talking and he said, why don't we, and so Mark had, and I'd been talking, he said, we should do a video, mate. And I said, yeah, we'll do it. And, and I had met uh, Chase through Eric Hunley, who we do his videos all the time. He's sort of like our fifth Beatle. Mm -hmm. So Eric and I, Eric connected me with Chase. And so we became friends over that. We talked on the phone all the time and Mark and I talked a lot and Greg and I talked a lot. And then Greg finally said, look, man, let's do a video. Let's get everybody together mm -hmm. and we'll all do a video together. And let's pick something to, uh, let's do the Tiger King. And we'll, we'll just talk it's about what one. we see. And I, yeah. yeah. So I sent everybody a video. I said, Hey, Greg, and, or Greg suggests we all get together and do a video. I'll zoom everybody and we'll just record it and, um, we'll put it on YouTube and see what happens. So we did. And so that first one we did was, and there's a lot of goofing off in that. When we do these things, we, for, we get on at usually about four o'clock and we start about five o'clock mm -hmm. on Tuesdays. And then we finish every how long it takes. And then from about 30 minutes after that is all goof off before that they are before that we're all goofing off, trying to make, make each other laugh and, and, you know, talking about things we've seen or done that week or that day or whatever. Mm -hmm. So Greg's Greg was the, the, uh, inst instigator in this case, because we were all wanting to do something, but we never thought, well, shoot, let's do it together. But Greg's brain is a process brain. So he sees things differently than, than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, what we could do is we can make a video da, 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 and we'll get to get, so it's, it's really his idea. Okay. To come and up just, with a channel. Just, what, yeah. Well, yeah. we didn't know we'd do a channel. We thought we'd just do the, that one. We didn't have a channel. We just, yeah. I put it on my YouTube thing. Mark put it on his chase and yeah. Greg, and it did really well on all of them. So we deleted it from all of our other ones and started our own channel. We put it on one thing and said, Oh, maybe we'll get a lot of views on that. And then, yeah. so we got those and we said, and we said, well, let's do another one. At the end, you can hear us talking. I mm -hmm. think Chase says, we let's do another one. And we're like, yeah, we should do another one. So it was a, um, it was really kind of happened on its uh, by itself once once Greg instigated it we just had the, so much fun doing it we would be doing it anyway if we weren't doing any videos we'd still get on there and goof around without recording it you know for an hour or so I'm, I'm yeah. sure because and we do started, that anyway you started a year ago right yeah a little over a year ago a little yeah. over a year ago I think May 3rd or something was our was a year mm -hmm. well you guys definitely need to check it out. It's really good. Um, if you, especially if you have kind of an interest in crime and criminals and interrogation, it's it's really really good. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of crime, I know you have a true crime workshop that you've released mm -hmm. with uh, Greg. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about what that workshop entails and what are the things that you would learn in a true crime workshop? Yeah. Well, we have, it's our flagship course is this thing called body language tactics. And you can, and you, you, all of our stuff is at bodylanguagetactics.com. Like we're starting this um, mm -hmm. membership site on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where everything is. So if you want to go, you can go there or go to the true crime workshop.com and you'll get there. Mm -hmm. And so what we were, again, Greg and I were talking and he said, you know, my, he said, Dina, his wife, 
she really likes these true crime shows. I said, Amber, who's my wife, said she's watching those all the time. And he said, I can't stand them. I said, I can't stand them either. So violent going for what we do for a living. You'd think that'd be, we'd be into it. But there's, you know, we were both like, yeah, they're so violent and gory. But then Greg said, but you know, there's there's a, a structure to these. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, because I've only watched a couple of them. He said, there's a structure to these. And I said, okay. He said, what if we put a course together where we, sh we, we walk people through this structure and we said, here's what happens here. When the first thing you'll see, first thing that happens is the 911 call. After that, the, the police show up and it's the first responders show up, the ambulance, the police, those types of things. And then if it looks like it might be a little iffy, the detective will show up. And then what happens from there? So, and they, and all these shows have the same structure, the very same thing. So we developed again from Greg's instigation, this thing called the liar's loop. And the liar's loop walks you through how to, and we're teaching it to law enforcement now, and it's really doing well. So it's sort of becoming the new way to approach uh, breaking down a lie in interrogation. And the liar's loop walks you through the things you see in a lie and how you can use things in that loop. It's five steps or four steps to get to the person where you, we, in interrogation, we call it boxing them in where they can't get out. They have to say, you know, well, I don't know or whatever. So you get them this thing we call the death spiral of a lie. That's the key to it for, for, for getting someone to admit they're, they're they are not being, are not, I don't want to say lying, but they're, that they're being deceptive in other words, mm -hmm. or something isn't right here. Mm -hmm. So we did. And so we went in and developed that in depth, that, that idea we developed that in depth. And that's a for in depth. That's the first thing you learn in the, in the true crime workshop is how the liar's loop works because it works throughout that show for no matter what your show you're watching, you can see that person. Part of the, the first thing that happens is when the person, uh, be, tells a lie it's because they've been triggered there's a trigger to tell a lie and that's they've murdered somebody so they got to make up a story mm -hmm. they call 911 and the cops show up and then so it, it, there are steps after that that tell you exactly what's happening in those and how to use each one of those steps to get to the right answer for things and once you watch one of those shows after you go through this course and it's not that long the the lessons are all three and four seven minutes long mm -hmm. you understand what's happening better and you can make a better call on whether that person is uh, guilty or, or not, maybe not guilty, but, but having more to do with it than they say or having to do with it than, uh, than you would before. And our mail used to be, Oh, you know, I really like the course. Now it's, I can't believe what happened in the show here. And they're explaining to us what happened from the things we did and taught them in the course. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, that's the fascinating part is how it's affecting people, how much they like it yes. once they get in there and how much they actually use it. Yes, yes. Um, so let's talk about lying a little bit and how to uh, maybe spot it. I know um, you guys talk a lot about finding a person's baseline. Everybody's a little mm -hmm. different and some of these tactics don't work on everybody. But maybe um, just kind of maybe break down some tips on how to spot lying or deception. Okay, well, let's talk about you because I've been there okay. to talk to you for a few minutes and it's <laughs> one of those things where you... No, 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 no. But when you, when you, as you speak with someone, especially for the first time and you get to, you, you just pay attention to how they talk, the, the tone of voice they use, how p high pitched is it? You're still, you're still not back. You're still not back to normal. When we were talking before this, you're still up here a little bit. So you're coming down slowly, but surely. So you're, you're not nervous. It's not me. It's just because you're working now. And you, so you've got your work thing on. So you're, you're slowly coming, your voice is slowly getting a little bit lower and you're starting to move a little bit more back and forth before you're all, when we, before this, you were, we were talking, you were moving around and then you sort of tighten up as everyone does when the camera comes on. And now you start to relax a little bit. You're actually, if you'll go back, you look like you're a little bit shorter than you were before. Not much. And that lets me know that you're relaxing some. Mm -hmm. So that's a baseline. You, you see what that person sounds like, how they react to your, and remember when, when you were talking earlier and I was interrupting you and, and asking you questions, I yes. shouldn't tell you this, but I'll tell you, it. I do okay. that on purpose because I like to see how you react to those. So I can get, so if I see you're surprised or you really don't understand, if I don't complete my sentence, I like to see what you look like. So I get, so when I, so if that, if I need to ask you a question and you, and I will know if you, I'll have a pretty good idea of whether or not you are pretending you didn't hear me or didn't understand or whether you really are because oh, wow. you made specific uh, expressions when you were doing that for those types of questions. That's why those questions were a little bit different each time. 
So and there were obvious questions that you never think of, but that's what was going on. So I, I shouldn't tell you that because now you're going to I can't trust this guy, but I can't help that. That's I've just done that my whole life. So it's one of those things where, where it just jumps out. So since you brought that up, that's, yeah. that's how you do it. You, you get the baseline by seeing how they react normally to things. You ask them questions, you know, the answer to, you ask them a couple of questions that, you know, they don't know the answer to, and then you see how they react to those and you keep that in mind as you go forward and you ask them questions about what has happened or a situation or what they've done or may have done or not may not have done. Mm -hmm. So that's in a nutshell, that's baseline baseline. If whatever changes from the way they were acting to the way you start asking questions in this section, that's that's the change in the baseline. So you'll you get a pretty good idea of what's happening. And that's all that is. That just gives you a, a really good idea of of whether that person is comfortable or uncomfortable. And that's the bottom line. That's what you're looking for are the differences in comfort and discomfort. Okay. As I'm speaking with you, do you become uncomfortable? And is if you do, is it something that I said? Is it something I did? Is it, is it this haircut? Is it because my nose is so big? What, what is it? So I, I, and then if I'm, if you're uncomfortable, I start talking and you become comfortable. What have I done? What have I said that's helped you calm down some? Yeah. So I'm not speaking as loudly as I was when we first got on here as well, because mm -hmm. That's part of it as well. I wanted to see how you would, how you, so it sounds like I'm being a little, not aggressive, but in a passive aggressive way, talking and trying to communicate and asking you questions when you, as you begin to talk. And I can see if you get frustrated easily, I can learn a whole lot about that. So the baseline, anyway, go back to baseline. That's, that's the key there is finding out how they act normally. Since I don't have a lot of time with you before we start doing this, or as I, as we, I know we have an hour or something you've got. So that's why I like to do that fairly, or I don't like, I'm going to say I like to do it. That's why I do that fairly early so I can see what you're, get a good baseline on and see what I'm dealing with. So your brain definitely, it's always like working as a body language person. Are you constantly always on and always like assessing people or do you turn it off? If I'm outside the house, I do. Yeah. I, but that's one of those things I, when you, when you train, um, law enforcement and the military to pay attention all the time. It's just situational awareness. Some people say, oh, you live in fear or you're paranoid. No, I'm just paying attention to what's going on around me. Mm -hmm. Most of the videos you see on TV where something goes wrong and somebody gets hurt or somebody gets robbed, they're not paying attention to what's going on. You go, I can't believe, what's this guy sneak up on this one? And and if I, all they had to do was do this. Mm -hmm. As they're talking, just get a quick look at what's going on and see what's the difference. See if, see if they see anything odd. And a lot of people don't don't do that. So, yeah. I I I use I, most of the time I don't at the house. It's my wife and I, and it's you know, yeah. No, it's not on at the house. But if we go somewhere after, if I'm with friends and those types of things, then it goes way down. If we're on the behavior panel with those guys, you, you know, no, it's you you like to think, yeah, we watch it. No, we don't watch each other. <laughs> you know, it's just because we're we're relaxed and you know, yeah. there's no no need to fear anything there. Unless you're dealing with an emotional situation, you might touch on something to see if you see anything weird, but mm -hmm. outside of that. So people say, can you turn it off? You do, but there's, there's really, and you'll hear other people say, oh yes, I can turn it off. They can't, they don't turn it off in no way because you, you're interested. If your true interest is in that, you'll say, oh yeah, I can turn it off. No, you, you don't because you want to see what's happening. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, it gives you a buzz to understand what that person's thinking. And you say, oh, okay, I saw this coming, saw this coming. Sometimes it, you may seem distracted or, or you may have a, you may um, change the conversation dramatically because you see something in that person's expression to something else. That would be the only cue to might let you know that somebody's doing that to you, I guess. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I think a lot of people may be oblivious sometimes to the signs and people's body oh, language yeah. and they're just kind of... Um, and, it, and it's kind of a disservice because maybe that's why they continue to have a lot of fights or maybe different stuff going on that they can't resolve. Exactly. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, I know that you are a healthcare body language mentor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, health, my dad's a doctor. So I grew up in that world, watch it. I'd go to the hospital with him. And, and when he read films, when he, he was a surgeon, he was, you know, a general practitioner and then became a surgeon that became a radiologist. And he would take me to the hospital with him. And I could, I could wait in his office and, and I could hear him talking about things. Or if he was reading films, he would explain to me what he was seeing, all those types of things. And so I really got interested in that. And I got interested not only in 
what was going on, but the relationships people had within that world, like you had the doctor, then you had the, the people that work with him. You have nurses and, and physicians, assistants, and different, you know, the receptionist, you have all these people that work. So I thought that was fascinating how that worked. Like a little, everybody had their own little beehive. So what we found out lately in the past few years is that technology is severing that relationship with the patient and the doctor. There's, there's, there's a gap there. And when that happens, that's when the, the malpractice cases just skyrocket. They go through the roof. But the thing that they found out as well that, that they've proved so far with studies is that when you engage the patients with, with specific body language and, and body language cues and, and what I'll call tactics since we have that course, uh, those malpractice cases plummet. There are guys that don't get sued because they engage these specific um, body language um, tactics is the only way to say it in there, not just with themselves, but with everyone in their office, everyone that works in their beehive. Mm -hmm. So when the person comes in, for example, I had, I found out I had um, thyroid cancer a couple of years wow. ago. And when I was, I was going through the process of that, I, I'd, I'd had a uh, parathyroid problem. Listen to me, I'm talking about my, I had parathyroid problem, had my thyroid taken out. It's like with those old women sitting around talking about what's wrong with them. <laughs> So, but it goes with the story. So I had, I was having my parathyroid taken out. There's, and um, as I went through this process, um, I went to the, to the doctor. And when I went in, I had to put my card in a thing. And, and then the woman, the, the, the lady behind, you know, the receptionist wasn't paying attention. She was just, she was looking down, never looked at me the whole time that I was talking to her. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say where this hospital was, but it was it wasn't where I live and it wasn't where I got my work done, where I got everything done. But it really made me mad because I went through a situation where nobody there was paying attention to me, like I need to have attention to me. But I, but I looked at it from a patient's standpoint because I'd been hearing there were all these problems. So I was watching all these and I experienced all these things people complain about are true. Mm -hmm. And I saw all these things go down, all these things happen from the nurse coming out and saying, Mr. Rouse, real loud and me not, you know, yelling my last name, not, not looking out, just looking down at her sheet of paper and kept looking down. And when she came out and did that, I didn't say anything. She said, Mr. Rouse. And then finally she looked up and I said, are you looking for Scott? Yes. I said, okay. So I followed her down the hall. We went through that and it was just horrible the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then finally the doctor, uh, I went in and, and my doctor wasn't there that day. The guy that was taking care of that at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I said, so I waited on him and he can't, another doctor came in and I he said, okay, what's going on? And I said, you tell me, I said, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know. Nobody's talked to me since I've been, they've yelled at me since I've been here. I don't know who you are. Nobody told me you weren't, you know, that you weren't going to be Dr. So-and-so coming in. So I don't know what's going on, man. But I tell you what, whenever my other doctor gets back, I'll come back. So I'll, I'll, I'll check it. Out. So I left. I just, I was so mad. I couldn't stand it. And everybody gets mad, but they don't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. And I feel so sorry for these, for, for, for patients who go in there, who are, you have patients in, in the, where I was sitting, these people, people were wondering if their cancer was back. They're wondering what cancer, the kind of cancer they have to have diabetes. How bad is it? Are they going to cut my foot off? All these different things in, in this office. And these people are hollering at them and not paying attention to them, not comforting them at all. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. Healthcare is care. Mm -hmm. so, listen to me getting all mad about that. But anyway, <laughs> so what I found out was, as I went through this and explained this to, to the doctor, he said, because he called me and said, what happened? And I said, here's what happened. And he said, we need to change that. And I said, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. So I walked him through what I call the patient engagement loop. Um, as, as right after we developed the liars loop, I was like, oh, I'm in the loops. And so I came up with the, the patient engagement loop. And that is bas basically what happens is when, when you go to the doctor the first thing, the first thing that happens, you have where the, the patient engages the staff. The first thing when you go in, you pay the, and, and if they don't say, Hey, how are you? They don't make eye contact with you. You know, those things. So you feel, okay, great. Cause you're scared to death going to the doctor. Something's wrong. That's why you're there. Or you're going to find out if something's wrong. So when you go in and, and all they do is say, yeah, go over to the kiosk and put your stuff in there. You, you're like, oh no, and you feel isolated and alone. There are ways to get around around those things. There's specific things you can do. Mm -hmm. Then after that, after that initial engagement, then you have the nurse or the PA or whoever comes out to get you. You have engagement with that person. 
Yeah, they, you know, the patient engages or the, the nurse engages the patient. And so they go down and, and go, in other words, go in the doctor's office, the doctor engages the patient. And then after that, the, the, the patient goes back and re-engages the staff. Mm -hmm. So you have this loop where you go through all the steps of it. And if you use these specific tools and you know, I guess tactics that I've set up in these things, man, the, and I'm teach I'm going over this with doctors all over the place and hospitals and the, Again, the malpractice cases plummet and they, they form actual relationships just like they did before this started because everybody's wondering what's going on. People are getting mean. They're getting bad because we're getting sued. Well, there, for some, in some cases, that's, that's why, you know, but you have some, some guys like, uh, Dr. Over, Overholt, the guy that actually found that had cancer, man, his place is great, you know, and, and there are other, there are other doctors, uh, uh, Dr. Kaiser, Jay Kaiser here in, in Nashville, the guy that takes care of me all the time, has for years and years and years. Man, he's great. Everybody there is just, I can't, I know them all. I love him. He's great. When he sees me, he's like, hey, you know, mm -hmm. he actually is interested. In, I feel like he is. When I go in there, what's going on? How are you? What, you know, let's, and, you know, you don't just talk about what's it, does it hurt? It, when they took that out, whatever, you know, he wants to know what's going on in here. How's it going? What do you need? What do you do? And talks to you. So there, there are things you can, you can do to make those, malpractice cases literally plummet mm -hmm. and working with a couple of insurance companies now on that as well. So it's, um, it's, it's, that's becoming a, a potent tool yeah. uh, using that now in a healthcare. Much, a much needed one. There's definitely a gap. I know from my own experience, I've gone and seen a primary care. They don't even look up from their chart. They don't even look at you, uh, you know? And so, a whole, yeah, the bedside manner, on that. they need a, yeah whole courses on bedside manners. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah it, it's horrible. So I'm glad you're uh, helping address that problem. Um, so can we talk a little bit about some common body language mistakes and misreads that, that people may encounter? Yeah, yeah, oh, there are tons of them. Those, we call <laughs> those absolutes. That's when somebody says, and I can talk about noses because mine's so big. They say, well, when he scratches his nose, that means he's lying. He's not telling the truth. It means your nose probably itchy. Itches. You don't have, and they say, well, there's yeah. erectile tissue in, in the nose yeah, in, yeah. in the nose. And that's why it makes it. No, there isn't. It's nose tissue in the nose. There's no erectile. That's, so there's all these things you hear from TV and movies and magazines. Everybody always hears when you cross your arms, that means you're not into what the person has to say. You're turned up. No, that's, that, that could show interest. You could be, you could be doing this and, or it's more comfortable that way, or it may be cold. There are instances where if that happens, you can say, yeah, it's a barrier, but it, again, it depends on what's going on, what happened with the baseline, mm -hmm. but you can't just look at a picture and say, here's what's happening here. They don't like each other because as you see in people magazine or whatever, because it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that you're seeing one little slice of really quick slice of time where that person may have been going like this because they had a bug on them. They're getting ready to itch it, but they're going like that. It looks like they're mad at that person that they're sitting where they may be leaned over this way because they may be getting ready to itch something. You just never know what's happening in a photo. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at, 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 I would say, extensive video of that person, see what's going on. So there are a lot of things that, that people will do that, that people assume mean specific things. For yeah. example, a, or the great one I like to use is this when I talk about this, is at the National Entrepreneur Center, I was the entrepreneur in residence from 2011 to 2017. I've helped people raise almost a little, or actually now I'm over half a billion dollars in funding, not just there, but from, from really around the world. And what I noticed was I would, I would video as we were, as I was training these people to, to do their pitches, so they could use their body language correctly and those types of things. And everybody, just as a side note, everybody I've ever trained in for uh, an entrepreneur for uh, pitching something. They've all been funded. I've had two on the shark tank and they got funded. Everybody, everybody, I've, everybody from man, woman, child, whatever, they've all been funded. And it's from, and one of the keys is this, is to understanding that the person you're looking at, if you're looking at a group of um, investors and they're there, for example, at the entrepreneur center, we would have 500 to 1500 investors from around the world watching these pitches. We'd have a big old, make a big deal about it, have a big stage and people come out and pitch. And I would video these things. I would video the rehearsals. I would video the pitches that would happen up to that point where we would, the crowds would get bigger and bigger. And I would always, not only would I video the, the person pitching, but the crowd, the people who were doing it. And what I noticed was when you're pitching to someone and they're doing this and they're listening to you, and, oh, yeah, it's 
they're not going to invest in you. They have, that's the last that they're thinking about their email. They're there because they want to be part of the show. They want to be part of their schmoozing or they're there because somebody said, look, my kid is going to be doing this, going to be pitching, whatever my friend, my wife, my husband, will you go? Oh yeah, sure. I'll go watch them. No big deal. And they'll come and they'll stand there and smile and watch the person that you're, that you want to really focus on. And everybody focuses on those smiling people when they're pitching, they think those people are into it. Yeah. The person into it is the person who looks exactly the opposite. They're doing everything you ever heard that you, that says someone is into what you're having to say is all this they're seeing. All, and this is for pitching. The, they're doing everything opposite. For example, a lot of times you'll see this and that's, that says everything they see them frowning. They don't like me. They see they're covering their mouth. They've got a barrier up right here. They've got their arms across doing all these things and they're even sideways. But what they're doing is that's when you're seeing internal dialogue and that person is thinking about what you're saying and will it work for me for what I need and what I'm doing? I'm going to go back to the office and tell these people we're putting one point three million dollars in this. Am I going to get fired for doing this? Are the years it's going to take to do this? Is that going to happen? Is their money line right? You know, what is go what's going on here? Is this person full of it? can I trust this person? That's why those body language things to show them that you can be trusted are important there, mm -hmm. but they're doing all these things that'll tell you, if you don't know what you're doing, this person isn't into you, uh, into your pitch, what you're talking about. Every person who's, who's invested in something. I haven't, I've only called one. I said, that guy's going to invest. I've only called one of those, but out of those groups of people, I'd say it's going to be one of these people here. You'll at least get meetings because that's what you want. Nobody's going to give you money right after it. But mm -hmm. they'll want to have a meeting with you. Okay, I want to meet with so-and-so. I would say, these people are going to meet with you. And about 80% of the time I was right, which is better than 50%. Mm -hmm. So because I could pick out a, in these crowds, that guy's into it, or that woman's into it, or he's into it, she's into it. And sure enough, they would call. Not every time, but mm -hmm. for the most part, they would, they would call them. So those are, the, those are a lot of them you'll see in that situation that are the absolutes. People think mean this every time, don't mean anything. You know, they're the yeah. opposite of what you think. Yes, very so interesting. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about, because uh, reading faces is very pertinent to what you do. And so when people get mm -hmm. like Botox and fillers and they're freezing their face, does it make your job harder? Uh, a little bit, but uh, you can all, you can always see like a little little movement up here. They don't get it up here. They'll get it right down in here is where it mostly happens. Mine, I should get that because look, this stuff's never got going the 11. away. Cause I'm, oh, it's horrible because I'm always going like, I'm always looking at people like, yeah. mm, you know, it's from being yeah. mean all the time. But so <laughs> when you have these, they never go away, but you'll, you'll see a little movement up in here. So that, that can help you a little bit. That's when you really got to start watching the little things they're doing with their shoulders, their neck, their head, uh, how they breathe their see if their eyes are dilating. If you can get close enough, those, those style things are what they're actually saying. And the mm -hmm. tone, again, the tone of voice, do they slow down? Do they speed up? Do they, talk quietly as they, in the sense, you know, as it get quiet or what we call or baiting facts. So there are a lot of things you can do instead of just watching their face. You can see, you can see little movements in there that'll give you a pretty good, good idea of what's happening, but I never fear that or, or cause you know, they've done it. Once you, once you get in there and get talking to me, you can see them just, you know, yeah, so I'm having a great time. It's gone. You know, you see one of those, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it didn't really bother me. It didn't give me a problem anyway. Um, so let's talk a little bit about interrogation, because I find that quite fascinating. Um, your background is in interrogation and training mm -hmm. interrogators. And um, can you kind of go over maybe some like typical interrogation techniques? Sure. Well, one of the first things you want to do is make the person feel like you're not a threat. That's the key, because you want that person to stay as long as, as, long as you can get them to stay, because in those situations, they can say four words. I want my lawyer. Yes. And then you guys say, okay, we'll see you later. You can say after that, are you sure you want to do that? Because once you, you know, there are things, tactics you can use, but mm -hmm. you have to get them a lawyer. You know, once they say that you either in some, some states you have to leave, you know, or they get to leave, but you can, you can add, are you sure you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Cause if, when you do that, here's what's going to happen. So you can add that to it. Um, Another good tactic, one of, the, one of the things, one of my favorite things to use in, in, in one, let's say if somebody's, because I, I do a lot with um, embezzlers, or, you know, there's money missing from banks and things. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things is when they, uh, when you use what's called the bait question, 
you know, you'll say, would there be any reason whatsoever for your DNA to be in that safe whatsoever? I mean, I know you don't, they don't let the whatever it is in there for whatever reason. Would there be any, any reason for your DNA? And what I, what I mean by that is, and you go on these ridiculously, you know, uh, skin cells when you maybe coughed and some spit came out and got on something or maybe a hair fell. These things that you would, you know, you'd have to be CSI to find, which you know they haven't found. Would there be any reason for any of that to be in there? And they'll say, oh, the person who, who I would still keep suspecting would say, well, I, I can't think of a reason why that shouldn't be in there. It shouldn't be, you know, but the person who, who didn't do it that you can usually tell will say, no, it wouldn't be in there. No, 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 not mine. Unless you put it in there, it wouldn't be me. I hadn't been in there. So no, it wouldn't be, they'll come out with a straight no. A lot of times they'll be in, you know, um, a bad word before that, but they'll, they'll be emphatic about no, but mm -hmm. in, in that situation, there, there are hundreds of little things you use, but I mean, if you, if you want to get specific, ask me something about something specific and I'll. Well, that. I think I've really been seeing one of your videos. You talked about like women interrogators versus men interrogators and their strength. Oh, yeah. Can you kind of touch yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Uh, women take in information much better than men. They can grab tons of information so much better than men. You know, there's, as you know, there are a couple of parts of the brain that help you collect information. The fusiform gyrus, that's what helps you see the little things and it collects information about the little things you're seeing situationally and with a person. And then you have the mid temporal gyrus, which helps you grab those big movements, all the big, like a plane flying over when my arms are moving real big and I'm moving around. It, it helps you, and it sends all the, these things grab this information and send it back to the locus ceruleus, that little thing is about as big as a BB back to the brain stem near the brainstem and that's the part where it goes it gathers all that information and starts helping you make decisions about what's happened in other words is this um is this a good situation a bad situation I, I i'm really not thinking about it but as i'm going through it and that's what gives you what gives men what are is known as a gut feeling we get a gut feeling and we just know it all because we're men and <laughs> we get a gut feeling but the most potent thing, and uh, probably on the planet, from what I'm learning as I go through this, women's intuition. Y'all blow men out of the water when it comes to what's right and wrong. How many times you've been watching TV and looked over at your husband and said she did that, or that they, you know, that kid they know that kid. How many times you said, "I said I just don't like her. I don't know why," or "I just don't like that guy." And your husband will say, "Why not?" And you say, "I don't know. Something's yeah. not right about him." And sure enough, down the road. Something will be wrong with that guy or that girl or that woman or that man. Mm -hmm. So women take in information. And, and when you talk to people, you take, you, you don't like when I come home, my wife didn't say, well, how was it? That was great. Okay. She says, well, who was there? Did you talk to anybody? See anybody, you know, what was so-and-so there? What was she wearing? Did he have that hat on? What's going on? Did he say anything? How does he feel? She wants all this information and you can't help it because your brain just collects all those things. And, and that's why women love, uh, in my opinion, social things. And they get along so well. And they, they have all these things going on because their brain can handle it. Where men just do these, you know, we have one thing we do socially. We have one thing we do this. Everything really basic. Whereas women's are like almost things, little things, are very organic. Little things yeah. growing off of it. You know, this relationship, this happening here. I go do that. So women's brains can handle that information. That's why women interrogators, can, man, they'll spot things you'll never think of. You come in after talking to somebody and say, well, so what, 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 do you, what do you think? And you'll think, well, this person did it. She'll go, here's why I don't think he did it. Mm -hmm. What? Because this is, he said this, whatever. Go ask him about that. You know, okay. And you go in and you find out, yeah, she's right. You know, you'll be 30 minutes into a four hour thing mm -hmm. and son of a gun. You go down that road and, and then the whole world opens up. A, it's a whole new thing. Yeah. So that's my experience with it anyway. Women interrogators are are just one. And Greg will tell you the same thing if if you get him on here and talk to him. They're fantastic. I mean, they they see things that men just don't catch and see. We'll see it and hear it, but it, we don't collect it that way. We don't go through it that way. We don't get that our gut feelings about the big chunks of stuff. Where women's look at all the little bitty things. That's why they're so good at it. So, so. I know in interrogation you need to establish trust to get that confession. And so would you find that women are more unassuming that they can establish that trust faster and that, um, 
I don't know. What do you think of that? Theory? Well, a lot of times uh, it depends. A lot of times women, some, the ones that, that I've seen will try to do the thing where they try to look all pretty and sweet and cute. And I don't understand this or that, but once you get into it, that goes away quickly and you get to talk to that person as a person, once you can get through those. So they, of course they try to, some people will try to build rapport with you as you try to build rapport with them because you, in my situation, some people come on a little bit stronger and, but I like to, I like to be the, Hey, we're sort of, let's just talk about this. Whereas some other people may come on a little bit stronger than I would because I want that person to like me. So I want to stay in there and be, and feel weird about leaving, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, women are, 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 they can see a lot of things and like, and, and there are, uh, other things they, they come from a completely different point of view than I come from. But once you start talking to them, everybody's pretty much the same when you get in there and start talking about if somebody's in trouble or not, if they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, most of the time they'll go down the same road. So it's really not hard to, to build that rapport with someone or with a, with a woman uh, in those situations. Sometimes it is if they're not, um, if they know they're in trouble and they're just going to fight you the whole time. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, but other than that, no, I, it's, I don't find it a problem. I've never really had much of a problem with it. Okay. Um, can we talk a little bit about artificial intelligence and, and technology and how it is um, impacting the body language world? I know like uh, with 911 calls now, they can kind of detect and uh, decipher lots of things from, a, you know, through AI and technology and making our mm -hmm. you know, the job easier. Can you touch on yeah. where we're going with that and what we can expect to see in the future? Yeah. Well, in those situations, you, you're, when you were talking about AI and, and 911 calls, you're listening to stress levels. You can, you can, we can't hear and see specific things. We can get a pretty good idea what it is. Say, oh, they sound stressed. But the, the, um, the AI can now figure out what level of stress they're at. What is this, is this person, by the way, they're saying specific words. Is, are they being honest or are they being deceptive? Whether it's, it's, it's not a hundred percent, how can it be a hundred percent? It's not, it'll be close. You know, people say, yeah, it's wonderful. It's really good. And, and because it will get rid of like interrogators, they'll, they'll, they, theoretically they would be gone. He just turns the machine on these people. But I don't, I don't think it's going to go that far because you know what happens in all the movies when that, when that happens. But, um, yeah, there's, but there's a lot happening. You, know, you, you see eye scans and you can, the computer, the uh, AI can tell where the eyes are getting bigger, smaller, and they can see hot spots on you and those types of things and take all those things in, into consideration that you can't see. So specific parts of the head and the face lighten up um, or getting warmer or colder as they go through a story or as they're talking. So it, it's, it's going to be, once, once it gets all worked out, we learn as much as we can about it. I think it's going to be fabulous. I think it will be fantastic. But well, of course, like anything else, you know, robots, you don't want them to yeah, rule the world. Bad. You're going to send so, a robot in yeah. the interrogation room. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. You, know, you always have to have a person there somehow involved. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, think so. I, I do find it fascinating though, how much um, we have, the technology has advanced just in the last like 20 years and applying it to situations like this that people uh, may not mm -hmm. even realize that, you know, the robots scanning you and figuring you out. So what do you have as far as body language tips for better communication and relationships? Um, listening, yeah. listening is the most important thing. And so when you're listening, a lot of times you have to look like you're listening. So to do that, all you got to do is, Cock that head a little bit so the ear gets, so it looks like you're using your good ear to listen. So you might, when somebody gets into something, you might want to not like lean in real hard, but turn your head a little bit. Look like you're listening. And when you're, when they're listening, just act like you're listening. Don't move a whole lot, you know? So, and nodding the head a lot works too, because once you start nodding your head, like you just did, once you start nodding your heads, the other person nods their head as well. And you can use, and yeah. And when it's your turn to talk, another, another, Here's what I shouldn't tell you this, but I want to tell you this anyway. So when I'm talking to someone and I got a lot to tell them, but I don't want, I don't want them to talk because I don't want them to be thinking what they're going to be saying next. I want their brain to think they're the one talking. So what I'll do is this, as they're talk, as I'm talking, once they finish, I'll 
turn my head a little bit like I'm listening to them. And I'll do my head like this as I do, like, you see how you start that? So I'll do my head like this. And as I'm talking, I'll, st I'll pull in a little bit every now and then. So it looks like I'm trying to get information from them as I'm talking and sort of do th one of these things. Not really big, not like, hey, look what I'm saying. But, you know, mm -hmm. so it looks really, um, it looks like my, looks like they get the impression that I'm listening to them, mm -hmm. even though I'm the one talking, because it looks like I'm listening and it looks like I'm trying to pull information from them as I'm, as I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. So they're specific. And then you sort of frame your face this way and you kind of, there are a lot of things you can do to, to help that. But that's, that's one of the key things is listening and looking like you're listening. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the way you'd say that grammatically correct. Yes. Appear to be listening. Yes, for sure. Um, so do you have anything else that you would like to add to today's discussion on body language, behavior panel, interrogation, anything you would like to add? Don't judge people by their haircuts. Look at this. Okay. It's one <laughs> I think of those. It's fine. <laughs> well, I've been wearing a hat all day and I tried to brush it real quick and make it look semi-normal. Um, I'd say try to, don't, don't believe there are absolutes. When you see somebody look down to the left or up and to the right, whatever that stuff is, don't believe that when they say that means you're lying when they do that. So I know that yeah. there are there are no absolutes. There's not one thing a person will do that will let you know they're being honest or dishonest. There's not one body language cue you can see that says that person is going to do this or they're going to do that. It it there are no absolutes. Those things may suggest something. They may may indicate or denote something, but they don't mean that's going to happen or that person is doing that or thinking that every time you see it. Yes. That'd be my. And people who are oh, trying to sell that are con artists. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, they just, they're, they haven't educated themselves. I used to feel that way until mm -hmm. I thought about it a long time. And I think they just haven't educated themselves. They think they'll Google something that's, that they'll see in people magazine or a, a movie, those types of things. And that's when they'll say, I know what that means. And they'll go out and start teaching people that. So I used to think there were cons and things, but as I got older, I realized they just don't have the right information. They're not con and they just haven't updated their, let me give you a real quick story. There's a thing called the, the uh, well, we won't, I don't know, 735 uh, or 738.55 rule of communication. I was going to say this, this will take three minutes. And that says that communication is is 7% the words you use, 38% the tone of voice you use, and 55% of communication is body language. Well, that's one well, of the first time I heard that. There's a guy named Mar uh, Albert Morabian, and I called him up. This was back in the 80s. And I said, hey, man. This is when he was at, uh, oh, not Berkeley. I can't remember what it was, the university he's, he was the professor at. And I called him up and I said, hey, man, I'm hearing this thing called the 738.55 rule. What is that? It doesn't sound right to me. And he said, that's wrong. That's not what people are saying that. I did two different studies that mean two different things. Mm -hmm. And what they're telling you, somehow somebody's put them together and come up with this thing. I don't know what that is. I have nothing to do with it. Please tell everybody you meet when they comes up that I didn't have anything to do with it. And to this day, when you see somebody say, communication is 7% words, 38% tone of voice and 55% communication, that person hasn't educated themselves. They haven't updated their, their information so they're not lying to you they're not a con they just don't know what they're talking about they're they're not they're, their studies aren't in depth not that they don't know what they're talking about but they haven't studied and updated themselves mm -hmm. which you know i try to do every day yes. but so i'm a little biased but <laughs> so that's what you're seeing actually oh okay good noted thank you um well thank you scott for being on my channel today i really appreciate it it's been quite interesting and um if you guys like this video, please leave a comment below and hit the like and subscribe button and uh, also the bell to be alerted when the next video drops. Thank you, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.